Today, the lead strategist for the super PAC that's supporting Nikki Haley tried to lower expectations, saying their goal in the state is to continue to grow our support. In other words, the super PAC does not have high hopes that Governor Haley will actually win the state where she served as governor for six years. Joining me now is Susan Glasser, staff writer at The New Yorker, and Jonathan Martin, senior political columnist for Politico. Um, Jonathan Martin, um, can you talk to me a little bit about what South Carolinians think of their governor? I mean, I know I'm sure this divides mm -hmm. somewhat sure. along partisan lines, but it sounds like Democrats don't exactly have a, a hugely favorable opinion of their former governor. Yeah, I mean, Governor Haley's challenge is going to be that the Democrats in the state who are engaged enough in politics to vote in a February primary are going to recall her governorship and probably not very fondly, given that they're partisans. Look, she's going to be relying on the same coalition that she put together in New Hampshire, which is basically a quarter of Republicans and then every independent you can get who mostly wants to vote for you as a vehicle to embarrass Donald Trump. It got her about 43 percent in New Hampshire. I think it's going to be hard for her to get that much in South Carolina with the same coalition, Alex, because there's just not as many of those independent voters in South Carolina. And one more thing, and this is crucial, Joe Biden is running in the primary in South Carolina, unlike New Hampshire, and he's going to turn out some of those independent voters to vote for him earlier in the month because the primary is on a different day for the Democrats. And guess what? When those folks vote in the Democratic primary, they cannot then vote three weeks later in the Republican primary. I raise that because Biden can effectively deprive Haley of votes that she'll need because you got to pick one of the two primaries to vote in if you're in South Carolina. That is such an interesting point that I think not a lot of people have focused on. Um, Susan, do you think, I, mean, I think the Biden-Haley relationship is kind of interesting, right? On one hand, it seems like it would benefit him to have at least a Trump scold, if not an outright critic, um, in the Republican primary, just to remind voters of, of, of who Donald Trump is, if no one else will. Um, and, and subsequently, I think the Trump's treatment of Haley could actually drive some Haley supporters to Biden in the end. But there is the question of whether it's not better for the Biden campaign to just have this thing be over with and have Trump as the general election nominee and go forward from there. Absolutely, Alex. I was just thinking that, uh, you know, when you were asking the question, on the one hand, you have Donald Trump uh, attacking her very viciously, as he has wanted to do, calling her bird brain and the like. She's out there today in South Carolina doing something that seems like right out of the Biden campaign script, talking about Donald Trump's mental competency, uh, questioning his volatility, the chaos that comes alongside Donald Trump in some ways, right? This is exactly what any Democratic campaigner would be saying right now. So it seems to serve uh, the overall interests of anyone who wants to see anyone but Donald Trump to be elected president this fall. At the same time, I noticed that the Biden campaign and Biden himself were very quick yesterday to decree the GOP primary race over and done with, and Donald Trump the effective, the de facto nominee, the same thing that Donald Trump is saying, because I think it is uh, in Democrats' interest. Their campaign plan is basically to scare the bejesus out of the country that uh, Donald Trump could be coming back. And in that sense, Nikki Haley interrupts the narrative and interrupts the campaign plan for Democrats. Yeah, I mean, and in the interim, Nikki Haley theoretically has to withstand the full onslaught of Donald Trump, she being the only object that's standing in his way of the nomination, J. Mart. I mean, tonight on Truth Social, Trump is saying anyone that makes a contribution to, yeah. and he's calling her bird brain, from this right. moment forth, it sounds very uh, sort of king-like, doesn't it, will be permanently barred from the MAGA camp. We don't want them and will not accept them because we put America first and always will. I mean, it's almost comic, Jonathan, like the language here, the threats. Right. But it does it's, have resonance, doesn't it? I guess if you're a MAGA person, a I mean, Republican. This is, this is like, you know, American politics for 200 plus years existed in a way like there were some things you said out loud and other things you said behind closed doors. Uh, it was called the proverbial smoke filled room. Uh, yes. And like Trump. Trump says them out loud now, like, we're going to cut off uh, and not give access to anybody who cuts a check for Nikki Haley from this day forward. It's like one thing to have your emissary say that privately to a donor, uh, but like for the candidate himself and the former president to say it publicly, it just tells you everything about Trump's willingness to, you know, break so many American political rules. It's Trump, though. Is he going to forgive and forget? 
Uh, probably. He tends not to have a very long memory when it comes to folks. But obviously, he's furious now that Haley won't get out. And this is going to be, I think, one of the, the, the toughest, uh, nastiest South Carolina primaries that, that we've seen, because you can just tell from the tenor of Trump's tone that he's going to bring everything at her. And I think she, she is going to be happy to hit back. And look, if this thing really does go for the full month here, what Trump's going to do is he'll beat Nikki Haley, but he's going to give the Biden folks a lot for their yes. oppo file. He will say stuff about Nikki Haley. Yes. A lot of a lot of it with tinged with gender, yes. uh, you know, type attacks that the Biden folks will happily play over and over again for months to come. This is exactly and this is what I was sort of vaguely mentioning to you. Susan, I mean, he's already tonight. He is, or yesterday tonight, he's deme he's demeaning her in just profoundly transparent ways, talking right. about her dress, calling her bird brain, right. you know, calling her an imposter. I mean, that's only going to go. <clears throat> that's going to get ratcheted up. That's going to go on steroids between now and the Republican right. primary. And like, that's great for Biden because it just reveals Trump to be a, you know, a hardcore misogynist, nay plus ultra. He doesn't care what that we think he's a hardcore misogynist is the problem, Alex, right? Uh, Donald Trump has one political playbook, and it is to, you know, whip his own supporters into a frenzy. He believes that misogyny plays for him politically. He's not uh, afraid of it. He's seeking it out. Uh, this is a man who, without shame, is, is attending his own civil trial uh, defamation case in New York City, where he's already been found uh, guilty of, you know, doing vile things. Uh, to a woman and then uh, impugning her uh, uh, by uh, speaking mistruths about it again and again and again. He's not afraid of the label of misogynist. He is all about his base. He is all about playing the kind of nasty bullying politics that he believes has, has gotten him a following. He wants his people to turn out in droves in November. And what others may see as an advantage for the Biden general election campaign, Donald Trump is playing his playbook, which is not at all about those voters. He's not interested, unfortunately, in what you and I think about him as a misogynist. Or what independent voters in key swing states may think, which might be a problem for the Trump campaign. We're going to talk about this more. Susan and Jonathan, please stick around.